Hi, I'm Brad Schwal, and I'm the president and CEO of the Center for Integrative Counseling and Psychology. Uh, we're honored to be a part of this Mind, Body, Soul retreat uh, because at our counseling center, at the center, uh, we care about our communities and their whole lives, uh, their minds, their, their mental health, um, as well as their physical well-being, and certainly uh, we believe that Christ cares about every part of our lives, and so we're here to, to care for the soul as well. Our center has a collaboration with Park Cities where we have counseling offices here at the church. Our center has a, a central office uh, near Lemon and the Toll Road, and then offices from uh, McKinney to, to Waco. We're at First Baptist McKinney, First Baptist Arlington, other locations, and the idea is uh, that we all face challenges at one time or another. Uh, Christ never promised us that our lives would be perfect, but Christ does promise us uh, abundant life, full life, and we believe that, that we can have a full life when things are going well, uh, and also when we're facing those changes and challenges. So our therapists, our psychologists uh, are here to provide practical help, support, um, ideas and help uh, when we face those inevitable changes and challenges in our lives. Uh, at the center, we've weathered uh, the pandemic and noted the layers of stress that people are facing. 20% uh, of Americans any given year face depression or anxiety uh, or something that we can diagnose related to mental health. Uh, you, you add to that the fact uh, that we have normal stressors every day, uh, traffic, work, uh, kids, schedules, add to that a pandemic that has caused us to have to problem solve, to, to make difficult decisions and to change the way we do life. So today we want to talk about uh, mental health, uh, about well-being. We want to talk about the different layers of that, our, our own mental health, but also uh, when we have grown children and even their children. We want to, to touch on today uh, children and teens and their mental health because in, in our families, uh, we're noticing uh, that they are, are living in a different world than we did. Uh, so to do that, I have with us our clinical director at the center, a licensed psychologist, Dr. Carrie Davidson. Uh, she has a background in psychology. Uh, she also has a background in social work. She oversees all of the therapy and the psychological evaluations that we do at the center and is great at providing uh, practical insights uh, that are also grounded uh, in science. Uh, we believe that mental health is a health issue. And so we need to approach mental health uh, if, for, from experience as well as research and, and understanding of, of how people's brains function, of how we face those challenges in our lives. So thank you for uh, doing this with us for sure. So I, I mentioned 20% of us any given year face a mental health challenge. How do we discern what is just a difficult time or just a time when we're down uh, from depression or from something that we do need to pay closer attention to? I think that's a great question. I think uh, we're looking at severity of symptoms. So we're looking at how much is that interfering with my life? It's normal to have periods when you're sad. It's normal to have periods when you're worried. It's not as typical to have sadness that makes it hard to get out of bed in the morning or sadness that keeps you from going to work or an inability to do daily life skills. And so those are some of the things we're looking at in severity. Now in depression and anxiety, we have a continuum, right? So we may have some minor depression that isn't keeping you in bed all day, but it's making you not as interested in things you used to be interested in. You're not as wanting to go to lunch with friends. It's, you're more tired than usual. You don't have as much of an appetite. Those are all symptoms that maybe it's not just sadness, maybe it's actually a diagnosable illness, like, like a depression. Okay, so it's impacting more than one area of our lives. Right. Uh, we're looking at, at that severity. That's right. one indicator of severity that uh, more than just work is being impacted. It's our relationships as well, or school. Um, and then, and duration is, is another one. Right. So um, if you would uh, walk through, you, you mentioned some of them, mm -hmm. uh, but, but what, are, what are those, uh, the, the symptoms, as we say mm -hmm. in more medical terms, that we see, let's say, with depression? 
Absolutely. So with depression, speaking speaking about adults, because it's a little bit different in kiddos, uh, with adults, we're looking at just a generalized sadness or unhappiness, lack of interest in things that used to be pleasurable, um, either sleeping too much or, or not being able to sleep difficulty either eating too much or not being able to eat. It's kind of either, either extreme. Um, those are the biggest ones um, that, we, that we look at. With depression, it's really important that we look at it as a serious illness. And so you're much more likely to have what we call suicidal ideation. So it is not unusual with true clinical depression to have someone have thoughts of wanting to die. And so that's one of the real important safety issues that we look at with depression. Anytime we are diagnosing depression, we are assessing for safety concerns. Um, that's also a, a radar for an individual to say, hey, this isn't, my brain is not acting the way it used to act. I didn't used to have these thoughts of not wanting to be around or or, um, life would be better off without me, or having actual plans of wanting to harm ourselves. And those are all symptoms of a serious depression. Okay, so we're gonna talk about how to respond, and we definitely will talk about okay. how to respond when someone is having suicidal thoughts. So important to talk about that. So between adults and kids, what is the difference? Because mm -hmm. uh, I, I do know that those participating in our retreat um, have grandkids and uh, they're very involved in their lives and so they may uh, see signs of, of difficulty. So how, how do you differ or, or how do they differ? How does depression differ in adults versus kids? So absolutely. So in adults, one of the important things, and this is actually true with kids too, you only have to have depressive symptoms for two weeks to meet diagnosis of a major depressive disorder. And the reason for that is because it is such a serious illness that we want to pay attention to. But with kiddos, with adults, usually at least one symptom is this feeling of pervasive sadness. Whereas with kids, that may be lacking, but there may be irritability. So irritability can be exchanged for that sadness because in children, especially young children, they're not really able to verbalize, oh, I'm feeling feeling sad right now, but they can be really cranky, they can be short-tempered, they can be irritable, and just that feeling that they're generally just not content is usually what we look at more than true sadness. Okay. So if I said to you, I mean, kids can get depressed, I mean, how, how do we respond to that? Because it does uh, seem hard, you know, looking at kids, how, how could they be struggling with such a serious issue? But how, how would you respond? Well, we have to remember that depression has a high genetic looting. So what that means is there is a high propensity for depression if you have depression in your family. So there are a certain number of kids that come into this world already with a predisposition to having depression. So it doesn't necessarily mean that there's an environmental influence. There can be an environmental influence. We typically see depression more in our teens than we do in our young children, but it's absolutely possible to have a young child with depression. It is something we tend to see more in our preteens and teens when we're looking at kids. Okay, so talk about anxiety. What are we looking mm -hmm. for? And then go ahead and answer how we you know, differentiate kids and adults. Absolutely, so anxiety we are much more likely to see in kids, especially since the pandemic, we're seeing a, a sh pretty sharp increase in anxiety in young children. We've been seeing that over the last probably five to 10 years anyways. Um, anxiety, uh, one of the big differences with looking at anxiety and depression is depression, we need symptoms for two weeks. I mentioned that earlier. Anxiety, we're looking at a six month period. So we're looking at a longer course because you can have some periods of nervousness, some periods of worrying. A kid might worry about a test, an adult might worry about a talk. But when we look at generalized anxiety, we're looking at pervasive worry. So we're having worry about general things daily. It's interfering in our ability to sleep. We can't sleep at night because all we can get are these worried thoughts. A lot of times the worry doesn't make sense. It's not rational. Um, so I may have a symptom of being worried about something that that isn't a problem, <laughs> but I'm making it a problem because I can't stop. It's these intrusive thoughts. I can't stop the intrusive thoughts of worrying about it. With kids, again, we see a lot of anxiety. We see kids that get what we call flooded a lot. So they get so overwhelmed with anxiety that they just freeze. And so a lot of times you'll have these kids that um, like social anxiety where they don't respond to an adult when they talk to them or they don't make eye contact. And I think as adults, we're immediately like quit being disrespectful, but actually they're being flooded with anxiety and they freeze. Okay. So that's a okay. good example. So staying on, on kids for mm -hmm. a minute, uh, grandparents may be seeing their grandchildren and noticing that they're having school behavioral issues. Mm -hmm. um, how can we understand what causes disruptive behavior or difficulties in school? 
is it their parents? Is it <laughs> mental? What, how, how would you just, what are we looking for when a child is, is experiencing some difficulty with behavior at school? So I think with behavior at school, we're always wanting to pay attention to understanding what is bringing up that behavior at school, right? So what is the trigger or what is the antecedent to the behavior that we're seeing? Is it that they're in a situation and that they're getting really anxious and so they're acting out? Is it a situation where we already have a lowered mood and so we're feeling depressed and so we're having some irritability that way? You know, are we having more of an environmental issue? Did we stay up till midnight the night before and so we're grumpy at school and not paying attention? I mean, I think we have to look at the whole environment. We have to look at what's what's coming into the situation, what's going on at home. I think it all works together. I don't think it's all just one thing. How, how does trauma, and, and when, when we talk about trauma, we're not talking only seeing violence. There's other forms of trauma, mm -hmm. but um, because a, a child might be in a home where, where there is violence or uh, there is uh, even verbal abuse. So how, how does trauma impact kids and their behavior? Well, no, absolutely. I think when we think about trauma in school, especially, we tend to see a lot of a lot of behaviors. A lot of times we'll, these kids will get labeled with ADHD. So they'll say, well, they're not staying seated. They're not paying attention. They're not on task. Um, and if you think about it, if you're dealing with trauma, you tend to be a lot more jumpy, right? You, you tend to be fig fidgeting in your seat a lot and moving around because those are some of the symptoms we see with trauma. You also have kiddos that may be having a hard time paying attention. So maybe their behavioral problem in school is they're not doing what the teacher asked, but maybe they're not even hearing what the teacher's asking them to do. Okay. So it's important to take those things into account. I think it's also important to think of, we think of big T's, because you know, when we think of trauma, we think of these really serious detrimental, but there's also little T's, just big disruptions in their lives. Sure parents being deployed, parents, changes in the home. There's other things that can be traumatic, especially to young children and can impact behavior at school. Okay. So shifting back to adults and, and you are hearing uh, Dr. Davidson talk about a wide range of mental health issues. And we do believe that the bottom line, it's important to talk about it that um, often uh, the church, um, it, this church has cared uh, about the soul and, and people's relationships, but sometimes the church, we, we are afraid to talk about what we're facing. So, so we are co covering some complex issues and yeah, you're getting a great overview from, from Dr. Davidson. Um, there are some other challenges that we face in life and, and I'm talking even schizophrenia, even other, uh, other forms of mental health challenges. Uh, I know it's hard to describe <laughs> all of that in, in very right. short terms, but, but, but people deal with a wide range of mental health challenges. So how, how would you define some of those other mental health challenges that we may face in our families beyond just depression and anxiety? Yeah, absolutely. So obviously we're more likely to see more of a depression and anxiety. Those are the most common. Then we get into more of the bipolar type disorders, which I think can be yeah, very impactful to families. And when we think of bipolar, we think of individuals that are having what we call manic or hypomanic episodes. So these are individuals that may have really low lows and depressive periods, but they also have to at least have one, at least one experience of what we think of as mania. So when we think of mania, we think of, um, the best example I could give is just a lot of pressured speech, talking quickly, risky, behaviors. risky behavior, spending sprees, um, really not thinking of consequences with behavior. So it wouldn't be unusual for someone to go, you know, spend $5,000 and then have $200 in their bank account. Um, staying up all night, but not getting tired. So when we think of mania, we don't think of, oh, they stayed up all night and couldn't sleep, but then they were exhausted the next day. These individuals when they're in a manic episode, may stay up for days. They may paint the house. They may reorganize everything. But usually their goal-directed behavior doesn't work out quite as well because they're not able to think through things as clearly. So bipolar is a big one. Um, when we think of schizophrenia and some of those, we're thinking of more of the psychotic illnesses. So when we think of the psychotic illnesses, we're thinking of individuals that have hallucinations and delusions. So the thought processes are off. So with hallucinations, we're seeing things other people don't see or hearing things that other people don't hear. When we think of delusionals, one of the biggest delusions we see is delusions of reference. So they're getting messages from the television. They're getting messages from um, 
Social media is a big place to get messages right now if you're dealing with a psychotic illness. Psychotic illnesses aren't as common, but much like anxiety and depression, they do have a genetic loading. So we do typically have, if we go back in families, we'll see more than one individual with a psychotic illness typically when we have psychotic illnesses. Psychotic illnesses don't typically show up till late teens, early 20s. That is more of the typical time that we see those things happen, but it's not I mean, we can have that happen much later in life too, in the 40s or 50s. We're not typically seeing psychotic illnesses in children. Okay. So when, when we're thinking about our own lives, uh, the lives of our loved ones, uh, often we're, we're facing day-to-day -day stresses, but um, I'll, I'll say again that that 20%, uh, that's, that's one or two kids in a classroom. Or uh, think about uh, the sanctuary or the great hall any given Sunday and think about those numbers. And then uh, you have that individual, but then you have their families and their friends. So, um, so important to talk about all that. Let's talk now about what we can do. So let's move into uh, the hope aspect of mm -hmm. things. And, you know, I find that, that one key to raising awareness about mental health and destigmatizing mental health is through information. So, um, so let's talk about the different forms of, of help. Um, you know, w when do we go to a therapist? When, when, do we, when does a, a, an evaluation benefit us? And then I want to talk about what, what happens in counseling. Somebody who hadn't done counseling, it seems kind of mysterious, but uh, we, we want to talk about how, how do we get help and what does that help look like? Okay. No, absolutely. I think um, maybe starting with kids and then working our way up, That's if great. that would be yeah. a good way to do it. I think with kiddo, kids that are dealing with anxiety, you're starting to recognize some anxiety. You're starting to recognize some things with your kiddo. They're not wanting to play with other kids. They're getting nervous. They're not wanting play dates. Things like that, a lot of times, when it's starting to interfere with life is the time to get some additional help, right? So we're finding that this isn't just a thing that we're spending a few minutes talking about and prepping them for. This is something that we're spending 30 minutes, an hour a day. We're having crying when it's time to get out of the car. We're refusing to do play dates. Like that's the time that we need to address this and see what's going on. We can always start with parents. A lot can be done working with the parents to help them learn what are some things we can do at home. Maybe I don't want, maybe I'm not quite ready to go to weekly to psychotherapy for my child, but I'm wanting some tools to work with them. So parenting consults is a great place to start. It's also a great place to work with a psychologist or a therapist to say, okay, I think this is outside the range of typical, but am I wrong? Am I right? What are some things we can do at home? I think that's the first starting place. Okay. Then with kids, we look at, okay, you know what? We need to really work on this anxiety, for example. We need to, one of the best ways to decrease anxiety is to work through and actually do what makes you anxious, right? So we know with kids that we don't avoid what makes us anxious. We actually need to do those things, but the children have to have the coping skills to manage that anxiety in the process. So a lot of times that is a therapist working with the child on building those coping skills, gradually exposing them to what makes them anxious in a safe way so that they're able to utilize those coping skills throughout, and bringing parents on board to do that together as a family. Um, and so a lot of times that's what anxiety treatment looks like with kids. If it's really severe, maybe we're having panic attacks. We haven't really talked about that. Maybe we're a child that our body is just responding in panic. A lot of times it is a time to talk with a psychiatrist as well and bring them into the treatment team and looking at adding um, some type of anxiety uh, medication that can help manage that as well. Okay. I think for adults, it's very similar to kids in that we know that therapy works really well for anxiety. We know that anti-anxiety medication works really well, but the both together is the gold standard when we're working with adults. And so you do want to have that person that can walk you through, can work through tools and skills to help manage the anxiety so that you can get through daily living. Okay. So uh, with kids in particular, perhaps an evaluation from a psychologist, mm -hmm. and that's very important when it comes to learning differences, ADHD, um, therapy is about skill building. It's about gaining perspective with kids. Uh, that's building up those tools. And, and, and I, I think that, that helps them for, for life. Um, so same with adults. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it helps to step back and have a third party who's more objective and uh, can challenge us, encourage us, but also guide us um, in psychiatrists and medication. Medication is another tool uh, uh, that, that can help address the physical aspects of mental health and, and so important that we recognize that, yeah. that physical com component. Um, so th this is a, a, a basic question for you, mm -hmm. but 
What happens in therapy? What, Absolutely. You know? Well, you know, we've been talking a lot about when to get therapy as far as interfering with your life, but I think it's important to know that preventative therapy is really okay. good. good. If we're talking about building skills, it's a lot easier for me to help a child learn coping skills when there's no need for coping skills or we don't have to utilize them as often than trying to get a child that's already anxious to utilize coping skills. And so preventatively, we know that's really, good, really a, a good tool. Um, I think therapy... I'll, at its core is about relationship. When you're choosing a therapist, you need to have someone that you can relate to, that you feel safe sharing with. It needs to be an honest space. But it's really about coming along someone and helping them navigate a, a challenge. Okay. Um, and it's, which is why the relationship is so important. And yes, we wanna navigate that by adding in some skills here or some education here. Um, but it's really about walking alongside another person while they go through something. Okay, for sure. So um, w w when we think about mental health, uh, we're, we're thinking about depression, anxiety, we're thinking about our well-being in general. Mm -hmm. And so that's the well-being um, of our relationships, uh, our finding meaning in life, mm -hmm. purpose in life. The pandemic, w what have been some of the key challenges that the pandemic has caused for mental health and, and overall well-being? Well, I think, you know, we're talking a lot about mental health when it goes awry, right? So different diagnoses. I think we also need to think about mental health just being staying healthy mentally. And I think for a lot of individuals during the pandemic, it was, it was a stressor that added to things and brought up some mental health challenges I don't think they necessarily realized they were dealing with. And so it wasn't unusual for us to have someone come in after the pandemic that maybe have never sought therapy services before, but recognized when they were home alone and they couldn't be over busy or, you know, they couldn't be moving 24-7, that when they just sat alone, that there was a lot of difficulties that were coming up, a lot of anxieties that were coming up. So we definitely, um, during COVID, have seen that increase in people wanting to receive services. In our teens, we saw an increase in severity. So we saw, definitely saw an increase in severity with depressive symptoms and, you um, I think just being taxed and stressed more than maybe developmentally they were ready for being placed in those situations. Okay. And, and there, there has been increased suicidal ideation. Mm -hmm. And um, I want to talk a moment about suicidal thoughts. Uh, we always say uh, that when you are concerned about somebody having suicidal thoughts, that talking about it doesn't give them the idea that, that we need to talk about it. Um, we also talk about the fact that uh, suicide is dying from depression or a mental health issue. Um, it's not committing suicide, it's dying from, from a mental health issue. So uh, w what are we watching for? How do, do we need to respond when we're concerned that somebody is having thoughts of suicide? No, absolutely. We always take thoughts of suicide serious. Um, a lot of times it's what we think of more passive, like I just don't want to be around anymore. The world would be better off with me. It may, it may even be just a passive comment, like, ugh the world deserves better than me, or I would, things would be better off without me. Those are even things we need to look at and get more information about. Because um, as clients will have described to me and as we will talk about, a lot of times when you're very depressed, your brain is not working the way it used to work. Your thought processes, a lot of people, and I've worked with people that have attempted suicide, and after the fact they will say, I don't know what I was thinking. Like I wasn't thinking rationally. It, it wasn't my brain. It was someone else's brain. And so we want to make sure when people are having those thoughts that we're getting them in help. We're having them talk to a professional. We're asking the questions. We do ask. If someone comes to me and says, I wish I wasn't here, well, tell me about that. Have you ever had specific thoughts about what that would be like or about what you would do? And so we are asking those very specifically. Is there plan? Is there means? Is there intent? With someone that is feeling depressed, we do, especially when we're talking about teens, we come up with a safety plan. We wanna make sure that there is someone um, that they feel safe calling if these feelings are coming up. We wanna make sure that anything that they could use to harm themselves, we put away and um, that the person has more supervision and more support while they're dealing with this. Okay, thank you for that. Well, thank you for sharing your wisdom. Uh, we covered a, a lot, a lot of ground, and we we believe that God has created us for for full life. Uh, that doesn't mean that we'll be without challenges. And the encouragement to you uh, is to make the most of your life by being as healthy as possible, in tune with emotions, uh, always working to have healthy strong relationships. Uh, there is much hope in our world. There are a lot of difficulties, 
uh, but there is a lot of hope as well. And mental health is about health. It's about well-being. Uh, we need to talk about it when we face a challenge, and we need to talk about uh, those barriers. Uh, but we also need to think about mental health in terms of what we can do to boost our mental health. And, and that means support. That means community. That means uh, serving and serving through the church, being a part of the, the church community, um, taking time for journaling, taking time for time with God, for prayer, uh, exercise, eating well. So um, I- important to focus on, on our overall wellness. And then when we do face that challenge, being open uh, to seeking help. Um, being open to uh, share with a friend or a family member. Um, Often we don't talk about mental health because uh, there has been over the years uh, perhaps a belief that there's something wrong with us if we deal with depression or we don't have enough faith. And so we want uh, to be a a counseling center and to uh, partner with uh, churches like Park Cities to help in that, that conversation. A couple of very practical notes, and that is that our therapists at the church are available to you. Uh, They're available to the community. Uh, PCBC.org, the church website, has a counseling page uh, with information about the center. Uh, The scheduling is done through the center, through our central office. We have therapists here at the church, but then also at other locations. So if you didn't want to come uh, to Park Cities, we have other therapists uh, other offices. Uh, we also are, are working with the church, providing support in the area of growth and enrichment, um, marriage, relationships, parenting, uh, a group uh, that we have been leading and will be leading for family support for family members of loved ones who may be dealing with a mental health challenge. So uh, we look forward to continuing that partnership. Again, going to the church website and searching counseling. Um, Our website, thecentercounseling.org, is a resource to you. Uh, So um, I I do want to close with something that's meaningful to me. And to me, um, it's a summary of Christ's presence in our lives. It was uh, recited every Sunday at 7th and James Baptist when I was at Baylor. Uh, Dr. Dan Bagby um, shared this benediction, and I'd like to share it with you. Um, That as you go today, uh, no matter what you may be uh, dealing with and, and each day, May the Lord Jesus Christ go ahead of you, uh, preparing your way. May the Lord Jesus Christ be by your side, a friend on your journey. Uh, May the Lord Jesus Christ be beneath you to catch you when you fall, and we all will. Uh, May the Lord Jesus Christ be within you, comforting you when you need comfort. May the Lord Jesus Christ go behind you, finishing what you leave undone. And above all, may the Lord Jesus Christ be above you, calling you, guiding you, and encouraging you uh, forever. Uh, Amen. So uh, take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Thank you for allowing us to be a part of this important retreat. Um, And we uh, uh, pray God's blessing in your life and in every aspect of your life. Thank you.